Amen, amen. If you would open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in verse beginning in um, chapter 16, Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. As you're turning there, I'll ask you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And at, that t- at this time, our children are dismissed to their classes as well. Matthew chapter 16, and we'll start reading in verse 13. The Gospel of Matthew. When you got it, say so. Beginning in verse 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then... He commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Lord, thank you for being a God that we can trust. Thank you for being a God that never fails. Thank you for being a God that is unshaken by the things that shake us. However, you are there with us in the midst of our shaking to give us firm hands, Lord God, and to strengthen us in the midst of trial and tribulation, Lord God. We thank you today for this time that we've had to sing to you and be reminded of the victory that we have in you. And we thank you for your word, Lord God, that instructs us and guides us and helps us, Lord, to know what your will is for your church. And so, God, as we are in your word in these next few moments, would you give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church? May we not be just hearers. May we not just be people in a room or online listening, but may we be a people who are attentive to your voice. And to that end, Lord, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. That my thoughts, that my words, that my my, my desires would bow to yours in this moment, that the preaching of your word would be pure, would be true, and that you would be glorified in it. Lord, I pray that we would live the truth that we hear today, that we would believe them, and that you be glorified in them, Lord God. We ask, remove distractions from our minds and our hearts. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you do not have an outline, just raise your hand and keep your hand up, please, so that way the ushers can see your hand, and uh, they'll bring you an outline. We want to be sure that you are able to follow along in the introduction of the sermon, and we want, to, we, want, we want to be sure that you're able to take some notes as well. And so, again, my hope and my prayer is that you don't just hear this message, that this outline doesn't just go into your Bible somewhere and maybe fall into a crack or a crevice in your vehicle, but that you take this message with you. And one of the easy ways to do that is by taking notes and spending some time um, going through what you heard this morning. I'm a firm believer that that when we gather in a in a setting like this that there are going to be things that will be said that are there to encourage your faith. There are things that will be said to, to, to hopefully instruct you in the Word of God. But here's what I want you to understand. I do believe that there are some things that you will hear that are specifically God speaking to you. And it is very important that when you sit there that you don't ignore what he is saying to you in particular. Now, you need to get it all, right? You need to try to take everything in that is in the sermon. I believe that to be true. However, there are some things, specific things, that I believe the Lord wants to speak to. And one of them that I I was so encouraged about this morning, if you haven't heard it already, but our God promises us victory. 
Did you hear that in the worship already? I was, I was so encouraged because, you know, just so you know, I, I want you to know, hey, you know so, sometimes, you know, you, you invite somebody to come over and have a conversation with, you know, with, with someone, and then you like, hey, I want you to talk about this, 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 and this, and, you know, you get on the same page. I want you to know Hector and I, we didn't sit down and rehearse that, praise the Lord. We didn't, we, we didn't sit down and say, hey, man, I'm going to be preaching on, on this particular text that talks about the victory that Jesus says the church will have in the world. No, no, no. But the Lord wants the church to know that he has a plan for his church, and that plan includes victory and in executing his purposes in the earth. Amen. It's important for us to grasp that. And so if you don't write anything else down, you should write this down. Our God is victorious, and he promises us victory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. There you go. All right. Well, let's move on here. In your outline, you see here, we are dealing with, this is the third, the third message in this series, church life, church life. And, 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 and the, the emphasis that I've been trying to make is that we, that we are not a, a book club, but we are a body. We are a body. We're not just a book club. We don't just get together and learn things that are written in a book, but we are supposed to be a body that is living the things that are written in this book. We're not, we're not here to critique the author. We're not here just to try to figure out or what, what is it that the author was trying to say. That, that's not just it. That's part of it for sure. But we are called to live what the author has communicated. And, and as we read the text, as we hear the preaching and the teaching of God's word, we are assured that God empowers us to live what he wants us to live. And so today we're going to talk about the family business, the family business. That's what I want to talk about. And, and many of us, we may not have this context in our lives of a family business that we could become part of, but, but we, we've seen movies, you know, and we might know that. And you may, not, you may have had a family business that your family was part of, and you were supposed to be part of that family business. But the point is that, that in, in a family business, there is a, a, a business that has been operated for generations and, 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 and is passed down to the next generation for them to take the family business and they learn the family business. They learn the operations and they want that business to grow because that business is the, is the life source for that family. And so what I, what I believe is that we are the family of God. And, and, and we are part of a family business. And so what you have in your outline here are a few things that I think are important for us to look at to establish this first thought. And it is that God has always intended his people to join him in the family business. Would you say amen to that? Well, well and, and, and just to point it out, let's just look through some of the covenants that we have in the scriptures. The first one here, and I only have three of the scriptures written out here, but there are a few others that are there that you'll see in a moment. But and, and the first thing that we see, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 31, we see this verse. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. That's the Adamic covenant. God makes this covenant with Adam and Eve, and he tells them that they are to be fruitful. They are to multiply. They are to have dominion. And then God floods the earth because after sin enters the world, people get wicked. They start to rebel against God, and God floods the earth, but he saves Noah's family. And then we move on to, to Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, it says this beginning in verse 1, after he comes out of the ark, then it says, so God blessed Bless Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth and on all of the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs Notice the blessing from Genesis in the beginning with the first creation doesn't change. It's the same thing. God communicates to Noah in this, in, in this covenant that he makes. He lets him, you be fruitful and continue what I have started. Continue the, the purpose that is there. And then we move on to Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. God is calling Abram, and he says, The Lord said to, to, to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name 
great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, we don't hear the go be fruitful and multiply here, but it's implied in there that there is that, that, that Abram, through him, there is going to be a blessing. The, the whole point of the nation of Israel being called out was to be a blessing to all nations, not to hold it over people's heads. Hey, we're Israel. That wasn't what it was. It was to be a blessing through him, the blessing. And we know the ultimate blessing was that of Jesus coming into the earth. And so the point is that God has always desired his people to join him in family business. We see this as well in a couple of more covenants that we see here uh, are, that are written out of the scriptures in Exodus 19 and in Exodus 34, we see the Mosaic Covenant. When God calls the children of Israel out of Egypt, he gives them the, the laws that, that, that he wrote down on the tablets and he writes them down. And what is he communicating to them? He's telling them, this is what kingdom people are supposed to do. This is how kingdom people are supposed to live in the land that I'm going to bring you. This is what is supposed to govern you. And the point of all of this is that if you do these things, you are going to be fruitful. You you are going to multiply. You are going to have dominion. You see that here? It, it, it's clear in the Mosaic Covenant. And you move on and you see Joshua when he enters into the promised land, a passage of scripture that's very encouraging to read. Joshua chapter 1. God communicates to Joshua and he tells him that he is to keep this law on his mouth day and night. He's not to depart from it. And if he obeys these laws, what? He is going to see success in what he does. He is going to prosper in everything that he does. Everywhere that he goes into this promised land that they're entering and they are going to see the victory that God has already promised them. As part of God's will and part of God's purpose. Then you move forward and you see in First and Second Samuel and in First Chronicles, uh, you see this in the Davidic covenant. He points to Jesus. David wants to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord is like, oh, no, you're not going to build this house. Your son will build this house. But he gives him a promise. And this promise is that there would be a son that is going to sit on the throne of, of, of David. That's where you get the idea, the son of David, Jesus being the son of David. It is a prophetic word that this Messiah was going to come. David David didn't understand that, and yet God wants him, wants David and his family to be part of this family business. And, and moving forward into the New Testament, Jesus with his disciples at the end of his time, right before he goes to the cross, in the upper room with them, in the Last Supper that we celebrate every time that we do communion, he establishes this new covenant. And in this new covenant, he promises that we would have a new heart. He promises that we would be filled with the Spirit. And in this new covenant, we see these things in the Old Testament writers, that these were parts of the promises of the new covenant. But he promises something else when you move forward, and you see it here in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Very important verses there. The, 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 the disciples come to Jesus. Jesus has already ascended. It's, it's been some time after he has ascended, 40 days. He's getting ready. Oh, I'm sorry. He is resurrected. He is getting ready. Ready to ascend. He's been with them for 40 days, communicating, teaching them. And at the end, you would figure that his disciples would have understood this already. And he, they say to him, well, Lord, are you going to now establish the kingdom? Jesus, you taught us for three years. You died on that cross. You rose again. You've taught us and been with us for these last 40 days. Is it now time to overturn Rome and establish the kingdom? And Jesus is like, my goodness. It's not for you to know times and dates and seasons. He's like, but wait in Jerusalem until you are filled with power and you will be my witnesses. He's going to fill them with his spirit so they can go forward and do what? Continue on in the family business. See, the, 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 the truth is that we see that kingdom expansion, kingdom expansion, this in your outline, kingdom expansion is still on the heart of God. It never changes from Genesis when God puts Adam and Eve in this garden. It is for what? To walk in communion with God and to extend the kingdom of God that is not on this earth, in this earth. That's what they were supposed to do. They messed it up. Jesus comes to regain this authority and this power to now give it to his church so that way we can be part of this family business, what God has desired. But here's the thing we have to understand as well. And, and again, the enemy has been equally committed to hindering our participation with the father in the family business. 
We see that from the beginning. I won't go through all of those verses. And, but, but here's what I want you to grasp is that as the redeemed, born again, chosen people of God, we must strive for the restoration of God's original intent for his family. And that is what? Exercise dominion, be fruitful, and multiply. That's still the same thing. And so here's the thing I want you to think about this morning. The family business, I've already said this a couple times, but I want to reiterate this. The family business has always been kingdom expansion in the earth. It's always been. Kingdom expansion in the earth. That's, that's the family business. And, and why, 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 why the terminology family? Because we're a family, hallelujah. We are the family of God. We are the household of faith. That is who we are. We're, we're, we're not just a, a, a gathering, you know. Uh, you know uh, we, we're, we're not just a people that just get together just to hang out, just to do good things. No, no, no. We are the family of God. And we have to be committed to what God wants us to be committed to, not what we want to be committed to. And so what is he committed to? Well, he's committed to extending the kingdom, expanding the kingdom in the earth. And so the first thing I want to ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, the family business succeeds as the king's dominion is recognized. The family business succeeds. I mean, any family business, you don't want the family business to fail. Hello. Hello. You know, you think about it, if you have, if you have, if you are, are starting a business now and you're thinking about generations, you're, you're, you're like, hey, kids, I want to teach you how to do this right, so that way when I pass the baton to you, this thing doesn't crumble, but it continues to prosper, right? That's what we would want. And so it's the same thing for our Heavenly Father. When he passes on, when, when he passes authority and he gives it to his church by his spirit, he wants there to be an expansion. He wants there to be success in this family business. Again, it's God's idea. We have here in verse 13. Now, if you go back, and you don't have to do this right now, but we're, we're in chapter 16, so we are well into the ministry of Jesus. Jesus has been doing signs and wonders. People are being healed like never before. He's been teaching and preaching with authority. There is so much that has happened in this ministry. There is literally no question, at least, that, that we have somebody special on the scene here. And, 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 and as you go back to this, as I was reading through these chapters following up and looking at it, the, 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 the Pharisees and the teachers, they were asking consistently. They were like, give us a sign. What sign are you going to do? Now, now, it's crazy because this is, a, he, they're asking for signs after he has already healed tons of people. You need more signs than that? Apparently, that wasn't enough, right? All that he was doing wasn't enough. He feeds 5,000. He feeds 4,000. And they, well, what sign are you going to give us? Are you kidding me? You need more signs to, to, to confirm that who, who I am? And so anyway, they're, they're asking him for these signs. And, and Jesus, at, on, at, on the tail end of this, he is with his disciples. And as he's with his disciples, communicating with them to, to beware of the teaching of the Pharisees, then he comes to this point. When he comes to this point, he asks him this question, beginning in verse 13. Again, we'll come back to this text. He says this. He says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, I want us to pause for a moment and think about how that question is written there. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus is making a positive statement here. I'm the son of man, but who do they say I am? I'm letting you know who I am. There's no, I'm, I'm not hiding this from you guys. I've called you so you can know this about me. Who, but, but, but who do they say that I am? And so they respond. They say, well, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, 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 and so what we have here, the first thing I, is that we see is two things that we have to note. We have, we have to note this is, is number one is that nobody in the crowds, none of them suspected that he was the, the Messiah yet. None of them had the idea that he was the Messiah. That's the first thing that's clear by the answers that are given. However, however, everyone, everyone knew that Jesus was someone special. They, they, they weren't sure who he was, but they knew that, 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 that someone like him was not just your ordinary Joe. He wasn't just your ordinary rabbi. He wasn't just your ordinary teacher or preacher. 
But, but he was doing things that made people stand in awe. People were coming after him because of the things that they saw him doing, and yet they didn't understand who he was yet, which is why Jesus asked his disciples this question. But, he, but, but when he gets the answers to what people are saying about him, then he asks them the pointed question, which is the most important question, which, by the way, is the question we all must answer. It's not what mama said about Jesus. It's not what grandma said or grandpa said about Jesus. It's not what my cousin said about Jesus. It's not what my uncle or my aunt said about Jesus. It's not what my great-grandfather said. No, no, no. What do you say about Jesus? It's not what your neighbor says or what the culture says. No. What do you say? What do you say? Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? So he asked them that question. Who do you say that I am? We all have to give an account for that question. God, and, but, but, but I, love, I love it because Peter, and, 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 and again, I, I have to point it out, right? When he says, who do you, he's, not, he, he's asking the group. He's saying, who do you all say I am? Who do, what do you guys think? You guys have been with me. You guys have heard me intimately. You guys have asked me questions. I, I'm teaching in parables, and, and I'm not answering the parables, or I'm not, I'm not explaining the parables to the crowds, but you guys are coming and asking, what did you mean by this? And, and I'm explaining these parables, and I've been speaking to you about the kingdom, and, and, I've, and I've shown you these miracles, and you have been present all of this time with me. You are there in our midst. And so as we're looking at, at all of that, what, what do you guys say about me? What do you say about me? What, what, what do you think? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, the, 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 the mouthpiece, right? He's the, he, he's, the, he's, the, he's the most vocal one of the group. He cries out, verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, son of the living God. What is Peter saying here? Peter, P- Peter's saying, you know, you're, you're, you're more than the prophet's. You're more, you're more than just someone special. You're more than just someone powerful. But you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You, you are the one who, who is to, that, that you're the promised one. But not only that, now you got to hear this, because he doesn't just say that you are the promised one, but, but he says you are the son of the living God. So important to our theology, right? What do we say about Jesus? Listen, there are plenty of people and plenty of religions that regard Jesus highly. Listen, you go talk to anyone who is, who is, part, of the, who is part of Islam and, and, and is a Muslim and they know the Quran. Guess what? The Quran speaks highly of Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. It's not the son of the living God. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, you, you, you name it, they, they speak highly about Jesus, but he is not the son. Why, 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 why is he not the son? He's not the, when, he, when, when Peter said, you are the son of the living God, he was saying, you are in essence very God. Because it's, see, it's one thing to say you are, see, here, 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 here's why this, this is why this is confusing for us. Because when we hear the term, you are, you know, you, you are, you are, you, John Carlos is Pastor Aldo's son, right? You think about that. Well, when you think about that, John Carlos has characteristics like his dad. He's, 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 he's funny like his dad. Hallelujah. <laughs> we have a video of, in, in our Core Faith 101, where Pastor Aldo had just shaved his face. And, and, and I realized when I'm looking at that video how much his son actually looks like him. Like they, they look alike, right? However, Giancarlos is not Aldo. He's part of Aldo, but he's not him. When you say you are the son of God, you are saying you are equal to God. It's Because di- God is different than us. Hello. You can't be the son. You can't be the only begotten of God if you are not in essence God. That is what makes Jesus different. That is why when you say that he is the son of God, you are saying this is, the, this is God in the flesh. Are you tracking here? See, th- 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 there's a difference when, when, when he says this, and, and, what is, and what does Jesus do? Jesus replies to him, and he says to him, and, and I love what he does here. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you. 
Simon Barjona. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Yep, you're, you're recognizing my dad. I'm recognizing your dad. The same way that, that, that you're saying that I am the son of God, you're the son of, you're the son of him as well. That's your dad. I'm recognizing that. And, but, but he goes on, he says this, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. Oh, you, what you just said is right. He is my father. Not our father like I taught you to pray. He's my father. It's different. We're sons and daughters of the most high God who are loved because of what God has done. But we are not begotten like Jesus is. He declares these words. And, and, and why is this so important is because here's the thing. We don't come to know Jesus on our own. Please hear me when I say this. You can't, you, you, you can't just like conjure up or work up revelation into existence. You, 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 can't, you can't just come into this now. God has to reveal himself. He has to show himself. He has to make himself known. He, if he doesn't do it, we're, our eyes will never be opened. Are you here? He has to do this. He has to make this crystal clear to us. And, and the, the bottom line is this is a gracious work of God. So, so, so let, me, let, let me just throw in an application here for you. You should write this down. The one thing that we should be praying for people as we're praying for lost people is that God would reveal himself to them. That, that we would get really desperate as the people of God and praying for God's mercy, that God in your mercy open their eyes to who you are. God, in your mercy, show them that you are God the Son. In your mercy, show them your great love. In your mercy, reveal yourself to them. Because no matter what they hear, no matter what they read, unless you open their eyes, they're going to continue being blind. And here's what I would say as we think about that. It's not enough to recognize Jesus is important, powerful, or even a prophet. If Jesus is not God, then Jesus won't be Lord, and he isn't really Savior. We can think highly of Jesus. We can, listen, we can think that Jesus is a great teacher who needs to be heard. We can look at Jesus as a great example that needs to be followed. We can look at Jesus as someone, yo, we, we can't talk bad about Jesus because he's like the prophet of prophets. That's wonderful, but that's not enough. Jesus has to be God because if he's, if he's not God, he can't save you. If he's not God, he's not going to be Lord. And so we want him to be Lord of our lives. So here's my question for you before we move on to the next point. What does your lifestyle say about what you say about Jesus? What does your lifestyle say? Because again, it's easy to say, oh, I believe that he's God the Son. Do you really? Would your lifestyle declare that? Would the way you live declare that? You can write this verse down, James chapter 2, verse 19 to verse 20. Jesus, uh, James is speaking there about faith and faith and works. And what does he say there? He says, you believe that, that God is one? He's like, you know what he says? He says, so do the demons. And they tremble. <laughs> Some of y'all don't even tremble. Hello. You say you believe, but you don't tremble at God's presence. You don't tremble at the thought of standing before him one day in judgment. I was with my niece and my mom yesterday, and we were having a conversation, and she was asking all these questions about the end times and revelation, because you know, every, per every person who gets born again wants to know the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. Good questions. Good questions. I love it, right? And I'm like, hey, amen. Let's go there. Let's get in. Let's look at what the book of Revelation, look at, you're, you're not going to understand everything, but you know what? The things that are crystal clear, let's be crystal clear on those. Amen. And you know what's crystal clear? Everyone is going to stand before the judgment seat of God Almighty. Amen. And when we stand before him, man, if our names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, there is a problem, my friends. And so we want to be sure that, that, that we have bowed our hearts, that we have, that, 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 listen, we have a faith that is greater than that of the demons. But that we have a faith that says, Jesus, you are Lord. You are God. 
I bow to you. I submit to you. I surrender to you. You are my Savior. You are my God. That's the kind of faith that you and I should have. The second thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, the family business grows as the king's dominion is exerted. The family business grows as the king's dominion is exerted. Again, this is not about profits, right, in the sense of what we're making. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about with the family business. I'm talking about the purpose of the family business being established, which is the expansion of the kingdom of heaven in the earth. That, that, that's how we measure this. That's how we, that's how we measure if we're being successful. Is the king's dominion being exerted? Is it, being, uh, is it growing the way it's supposed to? So we look now at verse 18. Verse 18, he says, and I say to you, again, he's encouraging Peter, And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He encourages him. Jesus calls him the rock. He he says, you are this rock upon which my church will be built. Now, now I want you to notice, we haven't heard, if you've read the reading through the Gospels, this is the first time in the Gospels the word church comes out. And so the church is not an existing yet. It is still future, but it is God's plan for him to do. It's the Father's vision to build the church. Jesus is going to build the church. And and we see here that his building project would not fail. His building project isn't going to fail. So the first thing we, I want to point out here is he says to Peter, you are the rock. You are the rock. And, and, and listen, there, there, there's, there's like a, uh, in, in Greek, there's a play on words, right? Petros and Petros. And, and, and so Peter is this Petro, he's this stone, but upon this rock, these stones or pebbles, maybe he, he you know, he, he, he points that out, that there's this, this difference there. You are this rock and this, and, and upon the, this rock, I'm going to build my church. So, so there, there's argument here because there, there are people who have elevated Peter to, 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 a, to a position of like the first pope is, is, is what, what, what has happened. Now, what I want you to know is that we don't find that anywhere in the text of Scripture. No, when we read it here, that, that's not what Jesus is alluding to. As you move forward and in, into the New Testament and you get to Peter's epistle, he doesn't say, hey, I'm the first anything. He doesn't say anything like that. So, so those ideas have to be brought from somewhere else, and that's just the tradition of men. But, but here's what has happened to us. In our effort to fight against that ideology, we've ignored what, what Jesus actually said here. Jesus did actually say to Peter, right? Because there's some different positions on this, and I'll be honest. I used to have a position that I would say the, 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 the rock that, that Jesus is going to build his church is upon the revelation of who Jesus is, and, and that is true, but that is not what Jesus is saying right now. Jesus is talking about a person, and he is saying to a person, he is saying, Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I am going to build my church. So what is he talking? Well, I want to give you a scripture because I hope this will help you out. And, and we, we, we got to turn there together. Just turn with me really quickly to 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn, turn there with me. I want you to see Peter's words himself since, you know, we should, if, if, Peter, if Peter's being spoken about, we should look at what Peter says about himself or, or about us as the people of God. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. And look what he says here. He says here, Coming to him as to a living stone. So who is, the, who is the living stone? Who is the chief cornerstone? That's Jesus. Say Jesus. That's the right answer in church. Hallelujah. Come on now. Right? He is, he is, the, he is the living stone. He is the cornerstone. He, he is the capstone. He's the one that everything lands and falls on. Everything is built from him. So he's saying, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Now check this out. Say, you also, you also. as living stones. You don't have to say that, but yes, thank you. <laughs> you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. So what did Peter do here? Peter did the same thing Jesus did. He called the people he was writing to, Stones, hello. They're living stones. So what is God saying? So here's what I want you to know. We we can go back to Matthew here. He's building up a, 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 a spiritual house. He's building up his people. And so all of us, say all of us, we're all stones. 
Hello? <laughs> We're all stones. We, we are all part of the building that God is making. When, when, when Pastor Aldo gets up here and he says, I get to welcome you into the house of God, that's kind of theologically almost incorrect, right? Because it, it would give the idea that this building is the house of God, right? Now, now, what, now, now listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not busting his chops. I, well, I am busting his chops, but, but here's the thing. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't, you know, he, he's, not, he's not trying to be heretical or something like that. He's simply saying, because this is the other side of it, where I say that's kind of theologically incorrect, is, is that we have separated this building as a place for God's building to gather. Does that make sense? So this is the place. If we are the dwelling place of God, then when we gather together, God comes to where we're at. We're the building. We're the building of God. And, and so Peter is this stone. He is the first one to declare that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the son of the living God, that he is very God in essence. And so God is going to build his church upon. Peter is, and if the book of Ephesians chapter 2 says that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And so what we see is that we as people are part of the building. Are, are you catching that? It's spiritual in essence because obviously we're not stones literally, but, but we are stones spiritually that we are being built together. God is building, he's, he's building up this spiritual house where sacrifices will be made, where worship is offered, where God is glorified. That's what he's doing in and through us. So Peter is the rock. We are the living stones. That's the first thing I would say there. The church, the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church, the ecclesia, the ecclesia. It is, it is derived, this word is derived from a verb meaning to call out. In a classical Greek, in, in, in classical Greek, it denotes the regular legislative assembly of people. Now, I wrote that down for a reason because, again, when we gather together, I don't, I don't know that we realize the power that is actually among us. I don't know if we realize the authority that is actually present when we gather together as the people of God. When, when, when God makes us the body of Christ, he brings us into his kingdom. You know, king's dominion, right? Uh, that, that's authority. And so the church is this place. We are the called out ones who God has called out to execute his authority, to execute his will, to execute his purpose in the earth in which we live. That's what God has called us to be, part of. We're, we're, we're part of that legislative body. Now, listen, we don't make up laws. That's the problem with the church. Hello. Is that we want to just make up laws, and then we declare them. And once we declare and we decree them and we enshrine them, then all of a sudden that's word. That's not true. If God has not declared them, if he has not decreed them, if he has not enshrined them, guess what? It doesn't stand the weight that is, that is supposed to, that the church is supposed to have when we're talking about authority. He says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, my called out ones, the, 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 the legislative body, the assembly of the church that, that is going to be used by me to execute my plans. And then he goes on to say, and the gates of hell, say the gates of hell, the gates of hell or Hades, right? The gates of hell or Hades, it will not prevail. Now, I, I, I know thinking, you know, back when I was growing up in church and, and I, I would read this verse, I don't, I don't know why, maybe it's just ignorance on my part, but I always just like thought, you know, I, what I thought of is like, like the church is, is immobile and, and the gates of hell that, that are coming against it are not going to prevail. But then some preacher said one day, he said, hey, you know, gates don't move. And I was like, oh my goodness. Such a revelation. <laughs> Gates are put in the ground with a post, right? They're, they're in mo They don't move. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
And then I understood what God was saying to the church is that we are supposed to be mobilized and we are supposed to be moving forward into territories that the enemy has set up structures to where people are not supposed to get it, especially people with the gospel and with the message of life. Because when you think of hell, that is the region of the dead, right? That is where dead things are. And here's what you and I have to understand is before we came to faith in Jesus, before we were born again, we were stuck in the bondage of death. Are you here? The Bible says in in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. What does that mean? That means that I was locked in by some gates into sin, but Jesus made me alive, right? God makes me alive through Christ Jesus. So what does that mean for us? That means for us that as we go forward, right? I love love the, the, the picture of we gather to worship, to be empowered, and then we scatter to share the gospel with this world. We gather to have our faith built. We gather to have our faith sharpened. We gather to be empowered by the Spirit of God so we can go forward and we can do what? We can plunder the enemy's camp. So here's the thing. There are gates all over the place of darkness. The gate, listen, you don't have to be deep spiritual to realize that the gates of hell are all over the place. That there are plenty of people that are stuck in that, in, in, that, in that arena of death. That there are plenty of people who are there in that region of the dead. And so here's the thing. We, we all, and I already said this, we are, we are in bondage to death until we are born again. But here's what I want you to get. The kingdom of God moves forward, not without resistance, but with a guarantee of victory. Amen. You hear that? You are Peter. Upon this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. Church, this is the gospel message that we have. That there is life in Christ Jesus. That those who are bound in death, that those who are bound in deception... That if they put their faith in Jesus, if they trust in him, that they can be set free from the powers of darkness. The enemy has no authority over their lives. But here's the thing. We don't just proclaim this, man. We got to believe this. Because here's what happens to us. We share the gospel with someone. We talk to somebody about Jesus. They shut the door in our face and we get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Pray for that person. Believe God to bring deliverance to their life. Ask God to bring others that will continue to hammer away at the gates of hell. Hello. We live church. We can't give up. The enemy's not just going to be like, oh, well, there's a Christian. Go ahead. Walk in. Like there's a clear picture that there's a battle that is going on. And, and, And I think for us as a church, we become so comfortable. We become so relaxed. We're like, well, you know, I shared the gospel. That was enough. Man, the power of the gospel brings salvation to everyone. Amen. The power of the gospel is enough. But is that where we just give up? Is that where we just quit? We just keep living our lives how we want to live, and yet people are bound in darkness, being destroyed by death, being overwhelmed by the powers of the enemy? No, the church is supposed to be moving in conjunction with Jesus and his power and his kingdom to bring people out of death into the marvelous light of the kingdom. Jesus is the embodiment of the kingdom, church. He is both Savior and he is Lord. And when that revelation comes and he reigns in a life, he calls that person, he calls you to become a vessel through which his dominion is exerted. What did I say? The family business grows as the king's dominion is exerted. And what does he want to do? He wants to reign in my heart. He wants to reign in your heart. He wants to reign in my home. He wants to reign in your home. He wants to reign in my neighborhood. He wants to reign in your neighborhood. He wants to reign in this region. He wants to reign in every region of the world. And as the church aligns with him and submits to his lordship, then God does that. He exerts his kingdom reign, his kingdom rule in and through us. And here's the thing. I want you to get this. We do not exert the king's dominion by force of hand. It's not because of our strength, our ability, or by craftiness. It's not because we're so smart or by the will of man but by the grace and the power of God 
Listen, this is the reason why, 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 I, why I walked us through the introduction and landed us at the end of the introduction on Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Because for us to do anything that I'm talking about here, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And not just a touch one time, but a continual filling, as the apostle Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians. To continuously be filled with the Spirit. That brings me to my third point. The third point is this. Say this with me. The family business business. prospers Prospers. as the fruit fruit. of the king's dominion dominion. is experienced. experienced. The family business prospers as the fruit of the king's dominion is experienced. I love, I love when Minister Hector was reading in, in, in our call to worship, and he was, he was talking about the, the Old Testament passage in Isaiah where a lot of us would just ignore those because they're Old Testament. But I love the way that, you know, it, he tied it in to where we see that we have been grafted in. We, 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 we have now, now we have access to the promises of God. And again, I, I have to say this because I think sometimes when we think of salvation, when we think of, when we think of this gospel, right, I, every, every week we walk through this gospel. And, and, and we talk about what Jesus has done on the cross. And we talk about how Jesus came. He died in our place in order to give us life and to save us. I think for some of us, we just think, man, you know, when we hear that, well, that's a ticket out of hell. That's what the gospel does, really. Like, like the gospel saves you from hell. That's really all I can offer you, right? I, I, when, when I preach the gospel to you, the only thing that I can really tell you is that if you put your faith in Jesus, you'll be secure for eternity. Okay, but what about from the moment I said yes to Jesus to the day I breathe my last breath? Does anything change in this space? Does anything happen here in this place, like right in this particular moment? You know, I, I was sharing, I have to share this, I, I was sharing with my niece, and we were talking about her, her, her um, coming to Christ and, and, and different thoughts, you know, that, that she has where the enemy, you know, is trying to attack her and things like that. And, and I remember when, the, when we did the baptism, the water was freezing, hallelujah. <laughs> Danny remembers that, he was like, amen, praise the Lord. <laughs> and when I hugged my niece, niece after her baptism, you know, I said, look, all this stuff is true, I said, but don't forget that cold water. Because anytime the enemy tries to come and remind you of your old or this or that, say, hey, I remember that water. I remember what happened that day. It's not about the cold water. It's just a reminder. I remember that. I got in that cold water, and I left my old man in that water, and I rose up a new man. So that means that, listen, when we get saved and the gospel really takes root in our lives, we are freed from our old man. We are freed from the curses that were over our family. We are freed from the bondage of sin. We are freed from that old man, that old way of thinking. We are freed to live in the joy and the peace that God gives us. We are free, listen, not just to end it there, but we are free to create a new legacy for the next generation and the next generation. We are freed in order to be able to live a life that brings glory and honor to God like that's what happens when the gospel takes root in us it's not just a ticket hey my name was written in the Lamb's book of life I'm good that's wonderful and rejoice in that absolutely but man when the gospel takes root when God saves you he does something great in you the family business prospers as the fruit of the king's dominion is experienced He goes on in verse 19, he says this, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So as a foundational piece in the church, the apostle Peter is given keys. He's given the authority to bind and loose, which signifies language of prohibition or permissions. So when, when we see these words, binding and loosing, is there some things will be permitted, some things are prohibited. There are some things that are, that, that, that are allowed, some things that are not. There, there's some, some people are free, some people are not. Like that, that's, that, that's what we see here in this admonition. So what are the keys? What are the keys? Well, Luke eleven fifty two, 52, Jesus rebukes the religious teachers of that day because they had taken the keys of knowledge and they had closed up the keys and people were not able to enter into the kingdom and they didn't enter either. And so we know that these keys have to do something that have to do with the kingdom of God, obviously, and people entering into the kingdom or being excluded from the kingdom. 
As, as we see this in the, in, 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 the, in the book of Acts, as we read through the Apostle Peter's stuff that, or the things that happen in the book of Acts, you see the Apostle Peter, he does what? Acts chapter 2, he preaches the gospel for the first time after the Holy Spirit comes, and what happens? 3,000 people are converted. He's there for that, and it's amazing. Power of the Holy Spirit moves. What happens? The church is born. In that moment, we see the church coming to life, and, and, and the first people who receive this are who? They're Jewish people. Either Jews or maybe people who were proselytes that happened to be there. But predominantly, it was Jewish people. So when, when, when the book of Acts chapter 2 happens, it's only Jewish people that are saved. But then you move forward to chapter 10, right? And when you get to chapter 10, there's this guy by the name of Cornelius. He is not a, he is not a Jew. He is a proselyte. He's someone who is a worshiper of God. He gives, he gives things away. He's sacrificial. He does good stuff. And yet God, he's not saved yet, though. He has a vision. He has a dream with Peter. Sends for Peter. Peter comes. What happens? Peter's preaching the gospel to them. And what happens in there? Come on, my Pentecostal friends love this verse. Come on now. As he was preaching that message, everybody in the room started speaking in tongues. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I love my Pentecostal folks. That's my roots. Amen. Hallelujah. But, here, but here's the thing. In, <laughs> In that moment, here's what I want you to grasp. It wasn't about the speaking in tongues. The speaking in tongues in that moment and the filling of the Holy Spirit was a sign of what? That Gentiles who had not been part of the promises of God, who had not been part of the family of God, are now part of the church. So what is Peter doing? Peter is opening up the kingdom by what? The key, the gospel. He opens up the kingdom with the gospel proclamation for people to be freed from their, their, their way of living, to be freed from their bondage and separation from God, to now be able to have access. So they're free to enter in. But then you remember there's this other guy, his name is like Simon Magus or something like that, and he's watching the, the disciples, and, and as, they're, as they're, they're laying hands, the apostles come, they're laying hands, people are being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he comes to them, and he's like, give me that, let me give you money for that. Now you thought Simon was saved because he was around all this time, he's following, his wife. Peter's like, man, your money be cursed with you. Simon gets scared, why? Oh, because that guy, now what, what is Peter doing? He's closing the kingdom on him. Because there's no real repentance. So what's the point in all of this? What are these keys? This binding and loosing is primarily, primarily about the gospel of the kingdom and it being opened or closed to people. In it, Jesus has made the way of salvation accessible to all. He's done that. He gives Peter these keys. If you move forward in, 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 this, in this gospel, in the gospel of, 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 of Matthew, you go to chapter 18, you'll notice that these keys are extended not just to Peter and the apostles, but to the whole church. And, you, and again, you can write this down. We don't have time to get into it. But my point is that we see that this, this same binding, he used the same almost exact terminology, except over there he's talking specifically about a brother who has sinned and who is unrepentant. And, and because he's unrepentant, eventually after you've confronted him once, after you brought him before witnesses, after you brought him before the church, he decides he's not going to repent. Well, you kick him out, you treat him like a tax collector. Side situation. We don't want people to leave the church. We don't want to have to kick people out. We want people to repent of their sin and walk in the freedom that Jesus offers. And yet, in, in, in that passage of Scripture, he goes on after that and he says, man, whatever you bind on earth, we be bound in heaven. And the point is this, and, and, and the writing of this, again, I don't want to get all technical here, but really what is being said here is what you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. What you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. In other words, what is the job of the church? The job of the church is to simply declare and execute God's judgments in the earth. And we don't do it in our own power. We don't do it in our own authority. We don't do it in our own ability. We do it based upon what God has said in his word. And so here it is. I'm wrapping up. But as, called, but as the called out people of God, who are, who are the family of God, as we come under the king's dominion, experiencing the benefits of the kingdom, hear me when I say this, we are called to share these benefits with others as well. And so the family business is about extending the kingdom of God in the earth. Not just, not, not, not just receiving kingdom things for ourselves, but extending the kingdom of God in the earth. And so here's my closing question. Are you living 
committed to God's family business or your own agenda? Are you living committed to God's family business or your own agenda? Think about your life. Bow your heads right there, please. Hey there, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that your time with us was helpful. Hope that your time with us was edifying to you. And I just want to say thank you for all of your support. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the shares. Thank you for the comments. If you are joining us for the first time online, would you please do us a favor and either email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. That is bishop at corefaithchurch.org. So I can thank you for being with us, get to know you a little bit better. Or if you have a prayer request, you can also email me there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead Ahead and you can leave us a message here uh, directly in the comment section, or you can send us an instant message and we'll get that and respond to you as soon as we can. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of your to all of you for your financial support. And if you would like to contribute to Core Faith financially, there's a simple way to do it. You can give electronically. All you have to do is text Core Faith. That is one word. Core Faith to 73256. That is Core Faith, one word, to 73256, and then follow the prompts, and you can be a financial supporter of the mission that God has given us. And if you are supporting us financially, I want to say thank you so much. I pray that God will bless you abundantly. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.